Well, church, it's uh, my privilege to be able to speak to you this morning. Um, once in a while, Pastor Barry uh, gives us, Pastor Donnie or myself, the privilege of getting an opportunity to speak at you, and uh, today is one of those days, so thank you, Pastor Barry, for the opportunity to um, get to preach the Word. It's always a privilege to be able to do that. I want to talk to you this morning, and we're going to continue our series on Dudes with Tudes. This is something that we've been in since about the beginning of the year. We've been talking about different Bible characters throughout the Bible. Some of them had good attitudes, some of them not so good attitudes, and we've been learning from both the good and the bad as we've been kind of working our way through this list of characters that we've been talking about. And the story of the dude that I want to bring to your attention today is, the, is found in the oldest book of the Bible. And if you think the oldest book of the Bible, most of us probably think of the book of Genesis, but Genesis is not the oldest book of the Bible. Um, this book and the, the main character share the same name, and that is Job. Job is the oldest book of the Bible, written before any other book um, of the Bible. So, um, if you've ever, have you ever, has anyone ever tackled the book of Job before and read it? Okay, several of you probably have. Um, it, you know, it's one of those books that you read it, and for some of us, it just, it leaves us scratching our head, yeah, because it is a, uh, it's a book that's filled with really dense Hebrew poetry. It's conversations between uh, four ind individuals, and it gets really hard sometimes to track with, and they use very poetic language. It's very nice and flowery language, but it's very hard sometimes to understand, and so it makes it a little bit difficult, and, and, and you couple that with the fact that this book of Job raises some really big theological questions, questions that have been asked, obviously, since kind of the beginning of time and uh, persist to this day, like, is God good? Is God just? And why do good people suffer? These are questions that have been continued to ask, like I said, since the beginning of time. Obviously, the book of Job is proof of that. And I hear these questions all the time as a pastor, especially when I'm talking to people who don't know Jesus. And even people that do know Jesus, that's one of the big questions is, especially why do good people suffer? Is God really good? And the hard part with the book of Job is, and frustrating part of the book of Job is, the book doesn't really give clear, concise answers to those questions. It gives some answers, but it doesn't necessarily answer the questions that it brings up. So it can be a frustrating book. However, um, there are some amazing truths in the book of Job, and I think we're going to be able to learn some things from him as we dive in this morning. So let's, let's get after it. I want to tell you a little bit of, first about who Job is. Job uh, was a man who lived in the land of Uz. Okay, we say Uz. Uz. That's where he lived. Uh, we don't know where Uz is necessarily. It's mentioned a couple other times in the Old Testament. And uh, the best that we know is that it's probably in modern day Jordan, kind of in the south, southern part of Israel, south, uh, be the south eastern part of Israel, so by Jordan. Um, Job lived during the time of the patriarchs. The patriarchs were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Those were the fathers of the Jewish faith. That's about the time that Job lived, was in that time. We know he had several children. We know he had three daughters. He had um, some amount of sons. We don't necessarily know how many, so that was a sign of a blessed life if you had children in those days. Um, he was extremely wealthy, and the way they measured wealth in those days wasn't your bank account. It wasn't uh, the cars you owned. It was the amount of cattle, sheep, camels, oxen, don donkeys, servants. Those were measures of wealth, and he had a lot of them. In fact, the Bible tells us he was very wealthy, and it goes on to number the amount of those livestock that he had. So Job was living a pretty good life. He was killing it in the old days, okay? He had a lot of kids. He had a lot of wealth. He was doing well. The Bible tells us that he was obedient to God, and he loved God, and he always did what was right. But then something happens to Job, and uh, that's where I want to dive into the Scripture this morning. This is a long passage. Uh, I'm going to read it because I don't really know. I don't want to just summarize it. I want, to, I want you to understand the full uh, weight of what happened to Job. So it's Job 1, 13 through 20. So let's go ahead and just read it and follow along with me and stick with me today as I read it. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking, drinking wine, the oldest, in the oldest brother's house, a, message came, a messenger sorry, came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one that escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens, burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. 
While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down your, and made off with your camels, and then they put the servants to the sword. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Well, he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at, your oldest brother's, at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. That's a bad day. All right? At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. He fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my father's womb, and naked I'll depart. The Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So Job has this wonderful life, and within the matter of moments, minutes, he loses it all. His wealth and his children are completely gone. You know, loss has a way of peeling back the surface of our lives and really showing us what we really believe, doesn't it? It kind of exposes what we truly believe. It exposes what we truly think about who God is. And some people, when they face loss, and I've been around a lot of people that have faced loss, um, some of them spin out of control. And I think to some extent, a lot of us, when we face loss, will spin out of control, at least for a while. And that, that might, that, that's kind of a natural part of the process. But I, I love what Job does when his world falls apart. He worships God. He acknowledges God's sovereignty. That's a believer. David did something similar when he was praying for his son. God told him his son that he had with Bathsheba was going to die. And David had been praying and fasting for this son to live. And uh, when the son died, David got up, he washed himself, he put on fresh clothes, and he went into uh, the temple or the tabernacle and he worshiped God. I mean, that challenges me when I see things like that. What does that say? How you respond to, to grief and loss and in those things kind of really tells us what you really believe. It has a way of showing us those things. So this series of events starts Job down this path of pain and suffering in his life. How many of you have suffered in this place, either physically, mentally, emotionally, or relationally? How many of you have said, and I really want to see your hands. I really do. How many have you, have you, of you have suffered? Okay, go ahead, put them down. Like everybody. We have all suffered. And we will all probably suffer. Man, isn't that an exciting message this morning? You're all going to suffer. We're never promised a life without suffering. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are going to suffer. Jesus himself said, you will have trials in this life. We are going to suffer. That's just kind of where it's at. We were, we were never promised a life without suffering. The question is then, if we know that we are going to suffer at some point in our lives, the question becomes, how are you going to suffer? That's a question that we don't ask very often in the church. How are you going to suffer? Because that question matters. How will you walk through your pain? If suffering is something that we all face, we should know how to face it. That's what I think Job, above anything else, can teach us today. I think that's the two that we can take from Job. In the book of James, we discover the two that Job was famous for and the attitude that we can learn from. So let's go to James chapter 5, verse 11. And so James, this brother of Jesus, writes this book thousands of years removed from Job. So he's got a lot of perspective. And here's what he says about Job. James says, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So a couple of key words in there. What is Job known for? Perseverance, right? You have heard of Job's perseverance. That was the tood that Job was known for. And so this morning, we're going to talk about perseverance. We're going to try to follow in Job's legacy and learn what it means to persevere. But first of all, let's define what exactly is perseverance. What does that mean? Well, in the English, it means steady persistence on a course of action, a purpose, a state, especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. So steady persistence, that's kind of the English definition for it. Uh, the Greek word there is huponame, and that means cheerful or hopeful endurance. Cheerful or hopeful endurance. So there's a difference between the way that people walk through pain and suffering, and I've seen it in my life, like I said before. And it, 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 the fact is, people handle it different ways. But the other part of this is perseverance is something that our culture doesn't necessarily prize anymore, right? We don't strive for perseverance. In fact, our culture kind of goes the opposite 
direction. We kind of, our culture is going in, in the direction of instant gratification instead of persevering on, with hope and with cheerfulness. And this idea of, of instant gratification is, is something we just keep getting more and more of. And, and it seeps into our life. In fact, we, we are in the place now where, like, I don't know about you, but when I sit down and, I, and there's a show on a streaming service that I really want to watch, I get annoyed when they don't just put all of the episodes on at once. When I have to watch it week after week, I don't like that, okay? Um, my son Isaiah, we, we watched The Flash once in a while on TV, um, story about a superhero, but um, he, he had kind of caught up all the seasons on Netflix, and then we started watching the, the actual ones that came out on the TV, and I remember the look on his face the first time we ended an episode, uh, the first episode it came out, so we watched it the next day, and uh, I remember the look on his face, and he was like, Dad, we got some more time, let's do another episode, and I was like, it doesn't come out until next week. He had no idea what I was talking about. That's a foreign concept. He's like, what? what? It doesn't come out because he's used to having all the seasons at his, disposable, uh, uh, at his disposal on demand at all times. And so it's just a weird concept for him. And, and for some of us in this room, we remember like the days before DVRs when you actually had to be in a certain location at a certain time on a certain day to be able to watch your show. Otherwise, you totally miss it. And then you got to catch up from someone else at work or, you know, at, at school or whatever. So, um, you know, this idea of persistence and perseverance is, is not something that we prize. It's the instant gratification thing that, uh, that we tend to gravitate toward. And like now, I don't, even have to, I don't even have to vacuum my house anymore. I got a robot that vacuums my house. I don't have to persist in getting my vacuum out and burn calories by going like this anymore. You know, like it was really hard to vacuum your house. We have robots that do that for us. And, you know, we have, I don't know, it's just, it's a, it's a different world that we live in where we don't prize just waiting on things anymore. You know, some of us, some of you in this room are under 30 years old. And for some of you under 30 years old, you'll, you'll never understand what some of us older folks had to go through when we had dial-up internet. You'll never know the struggle. <laughs> you do want to talk about perseverance when you're waiting for someone who sent an email attachment that was like one megabyte and you had to just sit there and wait for it to download. It was rough. You can pray for us. We struggled. I've been with people who have walked through pain and suffering with hope and steadiness. I've experienced people that, can, that suffer with hope and people that suffer without hope. People that suffer with hope are a joy to be around. The Holy Spirit pours out of them. I, I, I can't help but think of our friend Mike Forbes, who's now with Jesus. You know, he went to this church for years, and he had a lung condition in which there was no cure, and his lungs just got worse and worse and worse, and he could hardly breathe, and he had oxygen, and when he talked to him, he'd go because he could never catch a full breath. And he suffered for a lot of years. And we prayed for Mike a lot, but one of the things that stuck out in my mind is I, every time I had a conversation with Mike, I left feeling just, I loved it. I was energized after having a conversation with him because Mike, when he talked, he would talk about his condition. He would talk about the reality of what the doctors were saying. He didn't agree with it, but he would talk about it, which was okay. But he would talk about those things, but he would always talk about them with hope. But Jesus, you know, but God. And he would talk about hope. And every time I left a conversation with him, I just felt so good. And I remember having him in our life group, and it was my favorite thing in the world because we, we as a life group got to sit through suffering school with Mike. You know, we got to sit around, and we got to listen to his stories week after week, and we got to hear how he was suffering because he suffered well. And he suffered with hope, and he persevered with hope and cheerfulness, and he was an example. And so you got people like that, but then you've got also people that, that's, you got people that suffer without hope, and it's a completely opposite. When you have conversations with them, you leave emotionally drained, you know? They don't have hope. They don't have cheerfulness, and some of them even believers, unfortunately. And you can't wait to leave the conversation, and then they start talking, and they just deflate everybody else in the room. You know, there's, there's ways to persevere. There's, there's a good way to persevere and a bad way to persevere. And that's really the two that we're going to take a look at today and really learn from this morning. So I want to share with you a few thoughts from Job on how we, like Job, can have an attitude of perseverance. And I want to tell you this morning that, first of all, perseverance comes with perspective. Perseverance come with, comes with perspective. We read about Job. We just read about him losing his children, losing his wealth, um, Later on, he loses his health as a part of this whole thing. But what I didn't read for you is what precipitated 
this encounter where Job lost everything. So what we find is in Job 1, 6 through 12, and I'm not going to read it for us this morning, but please put that down in your notes and you can go back and read that for yourself. In Job 1, 6 through 12, we have this interesting conversation. We, we see this conversation between God and Satan. It's like God is holding court in heaven, and the angels are reporting about what they've been doing, and Satan's among them. And God says, what have you been doing? And he said, I've been roaming throughout the earth here and there, you know, just roaming throughout the earth. And God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. He's blameless and upright. And then Satan goes on to say, well, yeah, of course he's blameless and upright. Of course he loves you. Of course he's doing what you want him to do because you've given him so much wealth. If you give anybody that amount of wealth, they're going to love you. And they're going to listen to you and they're going to be obedient because they just want more wealth. And so God said to him, you can test him, just don't, just don't lay a finger on him. You can take everything else away, but don't lay a finger on him. And so we didn't see that. Through the entirety of the story of Job and the book of Job, he never knew about that conversation. Job never knew what precipitated his loss and his grief and his suffering. And I wonder if it would have changed Job's mind. I wonder how, if it would have changed how Job went through his experience if he had known that the reason that he went through his experience is because God believed in him. Isn't that a crazy thought? God believed in Job so much that he allowed Satan to test him. And then we find later on that the same, ex- same exchange happens again where, Satan, where God says to Satan, what have you been doing? And Satan says, I've been roaming through the earth here and there. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? Again. And Satan says, yeah, uh, God said, even though you took everything away from him, he still praises me. And so Satan says, yeah, because he's got his health. Anybody who has their health is still going to praise you. And so God says, go ahead and take his health, but you can't kill him. That was his condition. And so Satan then uh, infects him with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He couldn't even walk. He had to sit down. He scraped his open sores with broken pottery for, for relief. That's where Job was living in the, in the midst of his suffering. But Job didn't get that perspective that we got. We got to see the curtain of heaven peeled back, and we got to see something that he didn't see. And like I said, I wonder how it would have changed him. How would it, how would it change you if you were walking through suffering to know that God believed in you enough to allow you to walk through that? Would you walk through it differently? I, I would. I totally would. You know, I would go from being down on myself to saying, hey, God believes in me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to march this like a trooper because I know that the creator of the entire universe thinks I, I can handle this. He thinks I can do this. That's pretty amazing to me. And we don't necessarily know the full reasons that Job suffered. We know in part it was because of that, but um, we know that God believed in him in that way. So what am I saying this morning? I'm saying that there's a bigger picture that Job wasn't aware of. And with you and with I, there's a bigger picture when we approach pain and suffering and really in everything that we do that we need to consider. We should approach everything with eternity on our mind because we understand that. We get that part of heaven. We've been given uh, the clues to what's gonna happen and we know what, what comes in the future. But the problem is we tend to have such a limited view. So let me ask you a question this morning. Do all believers that get healed, do all believers that we pray for get healed? No. Let me read for you in Revelation 2, 21 through 4. Or, I'm sorry, 21, verse 4. It says this. This is at the end of the book. I mean, this is the very end of the Bible. He will wipe away, God, will wipe away every tear from there, who's there, the believers, their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Now, let me ask you that question again. Do all believers get healed? Yes. yes. Why do we say no? Because... Because it's like this. It's because we're like actors in a three-act play. Living on earth is like act one. Now, we've been given the script. We know what comes at the end. But we get so busy with act one that we forget about act two and act three. Why do we say no when we're asked the question, do all believers get healed? Because all we see is this earth. We get so, uh, we get our blinders on and we get focused on life here on earth, don't we? We forget, hey, there is a whole perspective that we're leaving out. We should have heaven on our mind at all times. We should have eternity in our hearts at all times. Would that help you to suffer to know that you have heaven to look forward to? It should. It should. And I think we do a pretty good job at this church of talking about heaven. I know Pastor Barry mentions it in his sermons quite a bit. We did a whole series on heaven. You should have heaven, church, in your hearts 
at all times. To know that there's something coming that's greater than what you're experiencing. To be able to walk through life and have that perspective on your mind so that when you're walking through suffering, you realize, hey, you know what? Even if, even if I was born into suffering and I lived to be 100 years old and I suffered every day for 100 years, do you know what that is in comparison to eternity? It's a half second snap. Our lives, James says, are a mist that is here for a little while and is gone like a vapor. The things that we see that we interact with on a daily basis, guys, it is so temporary. So let me read for you what Paul says about this idea and this perspective. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Let me read that for you again. For our light and momentary troubles, our suffering, our trials, etc., are achieving for us, are building for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Far outweighs what? The suffering and the endurances and the trials and the pain that we are facing. So what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. Let's live that way. That's what Paul tells us to do. He says, yeah, we live in the temporal, but... We have, a, we have a, a glory that's coming that far outweighs any trial that we face here on this earth. So don't fix your eyes on what's going to be here for a half second. Fix your eyes on the whole story, church. Fix your eyes on everything. And then questions like, is God good? Is God just? Those things start to come into a little bit of perspective. So what happens now is, you know, we say those things like they're in a better place. And, and don't get me wrong, I understand there's a time and a place to say those things, okay? After someone faces loss, those become, it's not the right time. But those statements, though, have been written off as pat answers. And I know I harp on this a lot, but that is not a pat answer. That is the truth. That is reality. There's people that have suffered on this earth, and I know sometimes we pray for them, and sometimes they don't get healed on this earth, but they get healed in heaven, and we say, why didn't God heal them? Why didn't God heal them? God did heal them. They are healed. They are whole. They are experiencing their reward. Why are we sad about that? Why? I understand we grieve the loss because we don't have the relationship right now, but that relationship is coming again in a greater way, in a greater form than it ever has before. Do you get what I'm saying, church? Get the perspective this morning. There's a bigger perspective out there, and if we're going to persevere and if we're going to learn how to do it the right way with cheerfulness and hopefully, if we're going to learn perseverance and have that tuned, that perspective is one of the places we start. Now, was that Job's lesson? Not really, but it was in the book of Job, okay? It's one that he didn't get, but I, I asked the question again, how would he have suffered if he knew the whole story? So let's talk about Job. We talked about him losing his health a little bit. Let's catch the story up a little more. So Job is in misery. He's hanging out there. Um, his wife says, Job, why don't you just curse God and then he'll kill you? And then you can end the suffering. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, so then his friends come. He has three friends that come. And uh, when, when they see him, they've come to comfort him. When they see him, they're so taken aback by what they see that they just sit with him for seven days in silence. I mean, that's how bad he looked when they came to see him. They just sat with him, didn't, didn't know what to say for seven days. And then after seven days, then they start talking, and we have this conversation back and forth between, you know, a friend will talk, and then Job will defend himself, and then a friend will talk, and Job will defend himself, a friend will talk, Job will defend himself, and that's kind of how a lot of the, the meat of this book goes, is this back and forth. And to sum up what the friends thought, just kind of in a, in a thought, is this. They were under this belief system that, um, that was pretty common to the Old Testament era, that if you do good things, good things are going to happen to you. If you do bad things, then bad things are going to happen to you. And I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but that was their basic belief system. So they would sit there and they would basically tell Job, Job, you screwed up at some point. Job, you sinned at some point, and that's why you are suffering the way that you are. And he kept defending himself and saying, no, I'm not. I, I didn't. I, I didn't sin. I, it, you know, I, I don't know why I'm facing this, but I'm innocent before God. And so we we'll go back and forth like this. Um, for a, the, Like I said, the majority of the book is, is them talking and responding to each other. Um, but it's interesting in the midst of Job's responses, I think we can learn something from the, that perseverance. Um, that perseverance comes with, humility, or comes with honesty. Perseverance comes with honesty. Um, his conversations with his friends get very raw as you're reading this. Um, Job, he holds nothing back. I mean, he gives them the full uh, force of what he's feeling. And his emotions, 
They, they, they hit the gamut. I mean, he's on a roller coaster as he's talking with his friends. Um, he, he talks about God being, he says at one point, I know my Redeemer lives and he'll stand on this earth. And, you know, so he's praising God. But then in the next moment, he curses the day he was born. He accuses God of shooting arrows at him. Um, he, he accuses God of sending terrors upon him. I mean, he goes after God. He doesn't hold anything back. And uh, I think what we can learn from this is being honest with God is okay. I think that that's what we can learn. When we persevere, I think we can know that it's okay to be honest with the Lord. God's not afraid of your emotions. He created them. He gets it. Being angry, frustrated, or confused about your suffering does not mean you don't have an enduring hope. You can suffer with hope, and you can be honest with God at the same time. They're not... That you can do both at the same time. Say it that way. Um... Psalm 145, 18 says this, the Lord is close to all who call on him, yes, to all who call on him in truth. God is close to those who call on him in truth. Does it say God's close to those who call on him wearing a mask? No. God's close to all those who call on him hiding their emotions from him, like he doesn't know already? No, in truth. God, this is where I'm at. God is close to those who call on him and are honest with him. Let's read the next one. Uh, Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, you people, and pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. What does, that, what does that verse say? Pour out your hearts to him. Pour out only the good parts of your heart, because God wants to hear the flowery things that you're going through. No, pour out your hearts. Pour out the good and the bad. As believers, I think what we lose sometimes in this is we lose the idea that we are in relationship. And I'll tell you what, if there is one thing that the book of Job screams, it's relationship. It's relation. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but this book screams relationship. As believers, being in that relationship with our creator, one of the, the, the great things about that is we can come to him and we can be raw and we can be honest. We don't have to hide our emotions. We don't have to pretend or put on some kind of pseudo faith for him. We can be honest with him. One of the things that I learned in one of the great classes that we teach once in a while called Love and Respect, it's a marriage class. One of the great revelations to me as I was going through that class is, um, because you understand I'm not really a, my, my personality is not really that confrontational. I'm not a confrontational person by nature. Um, don't get me wrong, I can be if I want to be, so watch out. But <laughs> I'm not confrontational. But one of the things that I learned in that class is, one of the, one of the phrases that stuck with me is that he said, women, because they're talking about the difference between women and men, and one of the things they said is women, generally, by and large, will confront to connect. And I was like, Whoa, pow, wow, women confront to connect. And so when, you know, your wife comes at you guys, and she's got some issues that she wants to talk about, um, that means that she is looking to connect with you. And I thought about that in terms of a relationship with God. Why can't we confront because God created us, right? God created women as long as, as well as men and the way that we interact with each other maybe gives us a little bit of an insight into his character and nature since we're created in his image. I thought, as I was studying this, I thought, well, isn't that interesting that women confront to connect for a deeper level of intimacy? I know that sometimes when my wife and I have loud discussions um, and we air our grievances towards each other, and maybe you've experienced this, that afterwards there, there comes a level of closeness with each other. Do you ever notice that? After you've kind of had it out in a discussion, um, loud discussion a lot of times, after you've had it out with each other, there comes this level of intimacy. There comes this level of closeness with each other. So doesn't it make sense that we can approach God with our grievances once in a while when we don't understand something about what the Lord's doing? Doesn't it make sense that we can just come to him and say, God, I don't get it. God, I'm upset. God, I'm angry about this so that we can have it out and we can draw closer in relationship. Does that make sense? But what do we tend to do? I'm angry at God. Psh, shut him out. I'm angry. Psh, shut him out. How many of you know that if that happens in a marriage relationship where one partner or the other one gets angry at the other one and just shuts them out, how many of you know that relationship is not going to last? It's okay to come to God with your grievances. Job did it. Look at the book of Psalms. Or, yeah, look at the book of Psalms. It's all over the place. <laughs> David is always angry with God, just constantly angry with God, and he's pouring out his heart. And it's amazing to watch the process because he starts out angry and he's mad at God, and he's talking to God about why life isn't fair, and why him, and blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of the psalm, it's like he's got all that stuff out, 
And then he comes to the place of just realization of who God is, and he praises him. It's pretty awesome. Read the Psalms if you haven't read the Psalms. They're pretty incredible. But it's that idea of relationship and how relationship works. It helps us to persevere. Because if you're going to persevere, learn perseverance, you've got to learn how to deal with those emotions. God created them, and they're good. They're really good. And they were meant to draw us close to him. So even in your anger, even in your frustration, even if you're upset and you don't understand, go to him and draw close to him in a relationship, even if you don't think he's going to like what you have to say. Go to him. Because I guarantee you that place of relationship is exactly where he wants you to be. So Job's friends basically do nothing for him. <laughs> he says, he, at the end, he's like, you're bad friends, <laughs> essentially, is what he tells him. You guys are not good. You're bad friends. Um, and, and so they basically kind of exit the story in a way and, um, after he has these conversations with him. And um, so Job then kind of launches out on this rant towards the Lord, which, like I said, he came to him and, and um, he's, you know, asking God for answers. He's launching out to him. And so then God comes to him and uh, he, he, he answers him, but he doesn't really answer his direct questions. Um, God comes to Job at the end, at the end of Job's rant and he shows up on the scene, and God starts to talk to Job and starts to challenge Job, and he starts to challenge him with something kind of odd. He says, do you, do, you, do you even understand things like the rain? Do you understand weather systems, Job? Do you even understand the patterns of animals and how they feed and how they, you know, what they do and where they go? Do you even know these things? Do you even know about the galaxy and the cosmos? Do you even know about the sun and the stars? And, and the systems that have, that have to be maintained for, for life to happen the way it happens. It's kind of an odd way to answer the question. But what God was saying basically was, hey, Job, you don't get it. <laughs> my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My, my, the things that I have to deal with and the intricacies of my intelligence and my understanding of the world is so far beyond yours that you can't know. God doesn't take him back to that conversation with him and Satan. Job never knows that. God just tells him, hey, I have an incredible, incredible grasp of the universe, and I have uh, ideas and ways of doing things that, that are so far beyond you. You know, I think about this in terms of um, the, the best way I can always relate it is with our kids, you know. It's just we do things for our kids that they don't necessarily love. You know, if I thought about if, if my chief goal was to make my kids comfortable, which is what we tend to want as people, God, why aren't you making my life comfortable? A lot of times that's what we're praying you know, more or less, God bless me, make my life comfortable. And that's not necessarily a horrible thing to pray because um, we don't pray it in those terms. But if I, were to make my, if I were to just set my life towards making my kids comfortable, then I, they would probably be on the couch with an iPad or a game system and eating junk food 24-7. Am I right? But I, I want them to do things that are uncomfortable. I want them to work, learn how to do things called work. Because why? Because I'm cruel to them? Because I don't like them? Quite the opposite. I love them and I know that it's going to serve them well for the rest of their life. I want them to be able to, um, you know, create an income for themselves so they're not living in my basement for the rest of their life, right? <laughs> I want my kids to be able to succeed. I want them to do well. I want them to get out there and make something of their lives. And in order to do that, they can't sit on the couch and get fat and eat junk food all day. Does that make sense? It's not comfortable for them, but it's what they need. It's that kind of an idea where God shows up and he's like, Job, I'm, my, my thoughts are so beyond yours. My life is so far, you know, I'm so far beyond you. And so finally at the end of that is, is God's pouring out this stuff about the intricacies of the universe and of the earth and of its animals and its weather patterns. Finally at the end of that, Job just, he's, he's humble and he repents. He says, God, I'm sorry for being presumptuous. You know, do what you want to do. He acknowledges, again, God's sovereignty kind of at the end of that time. And so I think what this teaches us is perseverance comes with humility. It comes with humility. There comes a point where, you know, I, here's the thing. People want to intellectually understand God. And you, you can intellectually understand the Lord's ways to a point. But I'll tell you what, there just comes a time when you have to just humble yourself and say, I do not understand and all I can do is trust. I've been in those debates, I've been in those conversations several times, and it always comes down to, I can't explain everything about God. If I could explain everything about God, what kind of a God would he be? You know? I can't. So it comes to a point of saying, you just at some point have to trust him. And again, people are like, well, that's a pat answer. You can't just say that. It's where it's at. I mean, it's the truth of the, it's the reality of the situation. 
You don't have a choice. At some point, you have to just have faith. And here's the thing. We have faith in things all the time. You know, that we, that we don't, we take our money to the bank and we have faith that they're going to put it in an account. And we have faith that when we go to withdraw that money, it's going to be there for us. Or when we pay a bill online, that it's going to be there. We have faith in our brake pedal every day that when we step on it, it's actually going to do what it's supposed to do. Every time we sit down on a chair, we have faith that that chair is not going to out from underneath of us, okay? We have faith in a lot of things. I don't understand why it's so hard to have faith in a God who has proved himself. Because there is proof, don't, don't get me wrong, being a, having trust in God is not intellectual suicide. God has given us plenty of proof. There's plenty of things that we can look at to see that there is a God who does exist and he does love his people. But we've got to trust him at some point. That's just kind of what it comes down to. Hopefully every believer, um, or as a believer, your experience with God will lead you to the conclusion that he is good. So just life experience. You know, if you have asked God, because if you ask God, he comes through for his people, not always in the way we want, but he comes through. And so hopefully that experience alone can lead you to the fact that he is good and he's worthy of trust. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts higher than yours. We're just not going to understand everything there is to know about God. But when we come to that place, it allows us, to, when we can trust him, it allows us to be free. And that's a, a process that could take a little while for some people. Some people you can trust the Lord pretty easily. Um, I understand that there's personalities that, that they're different in that way. Um, but at the end of it, in Psalm 147, 6, it says this, The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. He sustains the humble. So at some point, if, we are just, if we're humble and we trust him, he is going to sustain us. Through persevere, he's going to help us persevere. He's going to sustain us through that. So after Job heard God's reply, he was humble, repented, like I said, for his presumptions. God, in turn, he, here's what God does to Job's friends. God tells him, hey, you guys are in trouble. You need to bring, I think they had to bring rams, seven rams. You need to bring seven rams to Job and slaughter them, and then you need to ask Job to pray for you um, so that no horrible things won't happen to you. So then, you know, they go do that. And then God blesses Job by giving him back all of his wealth times two. So twice the number of cattle, twice the number of donkey, twice the number. And then he has more children. And it says the, the, the latter part of his life was even better than the former part of his life. So God restores these things that have been taken away from Job just because God's good. And, and that was kind of the thing. God's sovereignty is on display here. You know, it's God does what he wants to do. You know what I love in, in Chronicles of Narnia? Here's the thing before I even go. Here's what we want to do. We want to, we want to bring down God to a formula. And that's what his friends were doing. We want to be able to say, you know, if you just, if you just say verse A, B, and C, and you just, you know, if you just speak those verses, then God's going to do C, D, and F. Great. Um, and, and there is truth to the fact that God, you know, don't get me wrong, God is faithful to his word. But we can't manipulate God. And we put, can't put God in a box. And so we try, to, we try to say, God, you know, if we just follow this formula where we repeat these verses, then God is going to do this. And then when God doesn't do that, then we say, well, you know what? There must be sin in your life. Or maybe you don't have enough faith. It's the same thing Job's friends were doing. They were saying, if you're good, then God's going to bless you. If you're bad, then God's going to, you know, or, or you, bad things are going to happen to you. And then Job says, no, that's not the case. And they're like, well, then you must have sinned. You must have sinned somewhere in your life. So we try to put God in this formula. Why do we do that? Because we want to be able to control him. We want to be able to control it because that is, uh, th then we don't have a need for God. We can be dependent on ourselves. So if I just do the things, then God's going to do this. You know, what? in the Chronicles of Narnia, um, Jesus is represented by this character called Aslan. He's a lion. And one of the things that they say throughout the books, and I love it, is they always say, he's not a tame lion. In other words, he does what he wants to do. God is sovereign. Does God, is God bound by his word? Yes, he is to a point. He is, and we can trust his word. Don't get me wrong with that. But God does what he wants. So you can't, you can't boil him down to a formula. You can't say a mantra and expect God to do what he's going to do. Why? Because that takes the relationship out of it. What does God want more than anything? For us to be as close to him relationally as we can be. And when you try to put God into a formula, it takes God out of the equation completely. And so, do you ever notice in the New Testament when Jesus heals people? He heals them differently almost every single time. 
Why does he do it? Like one time he just touches a blind man's eyes and he says, you know, open your eyes. Another time he spits on the ground and makes mud. And put, why does he do that? He doesn't want it to be about a formula because he knows if he, if he heals somebody the same way every time, then we think, oh, we just have to spit on the ground, make some mud, and put it in someone's eyes, and then we're good. That's what we would do, right? We're human. That's how we, that's how we operate. We like to, to do things on our own. We like to figure out the process and then go that way. But it's not about that. It's about relationship. And so when I say the book of Job screams relationship, that's exactly what I mean. So Job goes after God and says, God, why? And he, he comes to him. And what does God do? God comes to Job and he answers him. The book is about relationship. Don't miss it. That's what it's all about. It's not about the questions of, is God good? Is God just? Why does God allow suffering? Because those questions really don't get answered that well. The book is about relationship. The book is about you and me. You know, we don't expect people in our lives to do the same thing every single time. People in our lives, we can know them for 80 years and they can still do things that surprise us. It's about relationship. It's not about finding a way to break God down into an equation. I have no idea where I'm at in my notes. <laughs> All right. Well, this morning, um, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much it. I just want to encourage you. I really want to encourage you this morning to walk through suffering, walk through pain with perseverance. Remember, perseverance is a cheerful, a cheerful, hopeful steadiness as you're going through what you're going through. Look at the perspective of eternity. Come to God in relationship, even when you don't think he's going to like what you have to say. And come to him with humility, and at the end of the day, just trust him. You know, I love this, I love this idea of, I think I heard this from the Truth Project one time. They talked about um, a young child who's sitting at the edge of a pool, and you might have heard me say this before, and their parents are like, come on, jump, jump, jump. And then the kid's like, or maybe you've been that kid before, and like, you know, they know there's mortal danger, mortal danger in, mortal danger, thank you, in the water, and they could drown. But at the same time, someone they love and trust is telling them, jump, I got you. And when they finally make that choice to jump, it's an amazing picture of faith because at the end of the day, they just have to trust that their mom or dad or whoever's on the other side is going to catch them. And it comes by experience. You know, they, they know them. They know their heart. They know that they're not going to do them evil, but they're going to do them good. And so sometimes in life, we're in that place of suffering. We're in that place of pain. We're walking through. And, you know, God's at the other end of the pool just saying, jump, jump, I got you. And we got to be able to be in a place where we're humble enough to trust him. Even though we don't intellectually grasp it, even though it makes zero sense to us, we got to be able to be in a place where we say, when God says jump, we say, yes, I'm going to. Because I know at the end of the day, God, you're good. Even though I don't feel it, I don't see it in my body, in my mind, I know that you're good, and so I'm going to jump. So when I say suffer well today, I hope you understand what that means. Suffer well. Persevere. Because even in the midst of your suffering and pain, you know what that gives you? It gives you a platform when people listen to people who are suffering and in pain because they understand that there's a depth that comes with that. And so um, if, you, if, if you're walking through that, number one, I guess I always want you to know too, it's okay to pray for healing. I hope you do every single time on this earth because it's okay and God does heal and he's a healer. Okay, so don't misunderstand my message this morning. Also, you can pray for God to deliver you from that situation. That's perfectly fine. But if God doesn't deliver you from the situation like he didn't deliver Paul from his thorn in the flesh, be like, you know, be able to say what the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, and say, okay, Lord, I'll take it, and I'll, sur I'll suffer well, and I'll lead people to the kingdom while I'm at it. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for allowing me to speak your word this morning. I pray, God, that, uh, Lord, this truth would sink into our hearts and the hearts of people here this morning that we can persevere. Father, I pray you'd help us to cultivate that attitude in our relationships, in our mind, in our hearts. Lord, to take the lessons, Lord, that you want to teach us through the, the story of Job and God to come after you voraciously in relationship. Lord, so that we know your heart and we can trust you wherever you're going to lead us and we can say yes to you. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for the privilege to be your children and be able to walk with you. We love you. We give you thanks. I pray that you would anoint this, this crowd and this people that are watching online this morning and that you bless them and that you give them an amazing week. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Love y'all. We'll see you Wednesday.